Good morning, church. Good morning. How y'all doing? Great. Let me invite our dear uh, certified lay minister, Dakota, to come on up front to lead us in our opening prayer. Let me invite you as you are able to stand in body or spirit that we may open our service in prayer. Good morning. It is good to be with you, and we welcome those of you joining us in your place of worship. Please join me in the spirit of prayer. Most holy God, we come together in worship this day to proclaim your goodness and declare your greatness. Stir our hearts that we may bring you the worship you deserve. Send your Holy Spirit to guide us in our worship. May all we do, say, and sing bring honor and glory to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. be hearing this morning from the Gospel of John, chapter 14. It is among my favoritest, most favorite passages in our scriptures. Uh, the Gospel of John, this piece comes from uh, what is often called Jesus' farewell discourse. It is him uh, talking to the disciples, uh, coming close to being arrested, uh, and offering some vision to the disciples for what is going to happen. Be comforted is part of his point. Um, for many, this passage is, cause, uh, is the, their cause to understand Christianity as an exclusive religion focused on our heavenly life. Uh, this passage may send you and, and make you believe that the only thing about faith that matters is what happens after you die. Um, this passage, I think, does much more than that. Um, it answers the questions of our heart about indeed where Jesus is going, what he's going to do when he gets there, um, but also about how we are to follow him. It's a, <laughs> it's a scripture of geography, but it's also a scripture of how we live our life. Do not let your hearts be troubled. That's the way it is translated, but another scholar suggests that that's not, what, that's not the best translation. A better translation for the first verse that you will hear might be, do not let your heart be troubled. Uh, your, do not let your heart be troubled. Um, your obviously is singular, um, each one of you, um, but heart, heart is also singular. Do not let your heart. The scripture is talking about a community experience. Do not let your heart, not hearts, be troubled. Um, I will clarify that maybe 
after you hear the scriptures. Let me invite Diane to come on up front to share with you our passage for the day. Good morning. Um, the scriptures for today uh, are from the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 1 through 14. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do, not where you, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, Show us the Father, and we will be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you all this time, Philip, and you still do not know me? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own. But the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. But if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Very truly I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and, in fact, will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. It is a rich passage. Um, there is a lot to it. Um, and I want to uh, focus us in uh, just a little bit. We have communion this Sunday, so uh, just um, this passage as, as sort of a nugget to our faith, if you will. Um, the Gospel of John is focused on us believing in Jesus and having faith even when we don't see a miracle or the miraculous. The good news of John is that Jesus is the one way to salvation, and through him you will have eternal life. The Gospel of John is, is inviting us to believe that. For many, the exclusiveness of the Christian faith is a challenge. There are many studies that are done about many in the world m believe that there is some intrinsic value, some worth in many different religions. And they struggle with this kind of passage that makes Jesus the one way. How do, we, how do we wrestle with that? How do we have that in our heart? How do we frame that and take that in? So, uh, obviously, in a worship service such as this, we don't have a lot of time to go through all of that, all of our wrestling with that. So rather than defending or refuting Johnny and theology, our scripture offers today. Um, what I want us to do is think about this passage as a gift that is inviting us to engage in a conversation about things that are of ultimate concern. This passage frames itself and invites us into a conversation about our life, our death, what happened before we got here, what happens while we're here, and what happens after we die. This kind of passage invites us to that kind of deep thinking, deep reflecting, deep faith. As we approach this passage in the 14th chapter of John, 
Jesus has just given the disciples the new commandment. I give you a new commandment. Love one another. After telling them that he's going to be going away. Simon Peter has just asked Jesus where he's going. Um, I always feel like when Simon Peter is, where are you going, Jesus? It's a little bit like Simon Peter yelling, it's another road trip with Jesus. Where are we going, Jesus? The farewell discourse from Jesus takes up a question of where we go when we aren't physically alive. After we travel the ultimate journey of life and death, what's going to happen? Uh, as you can hear there, Simon Peter is missing the mark again. Disciples regularly kind of miss the mark. It's one of the key features of our, um, <laughs> of our faith that disciples struggle to understand what Jesus is saying. And this passage is, is um, no different. It even highlights that. Where are we going? Jesus trying to explain to them. And the passage you have heard many times, probably at a memorial service, in my father's house there are many dwelling places. Jesus offers comfort to the disciples, right? I'm going somewhere, they're, wait, what? It's okay, it's gonna be fine is what Jesus is saying. I'm not leaving you alone, I'm not going to abandon you, don't, don't fear. Do not let your heart be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. Jesus is speaking to them as a community of faith. While we are individuals experiencing God, we go together as a family, as a body, as a group. That's part of why that translation, why I mentioned it um, before we heard the scripture. To drive home the point that Jesus is talking to us as one body, as one group, recognizing the heart that we hold together. Thomas, um, that same doubting Thomas that, that we love dearly, echoes in this passage a curiosity previously asked. We don't know where you're going, Jesus. How can we know? How can we get there? It's really a statement that Thomas is making, but I hear it more as a question, as a pleading. Please, Jesus, we don't know where you're going. Help us out here. Jesus responds, I'm the way, I'm the truth, and I'm the life. We've heard that passage a number of times over our lifetime as this one way to God. Philip asks another pleading kind of question in the form of a statement. Lord, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. Do you remember um, the Gospel of John's point is to have faith without needing to see. To have faith without needing the proof, right? So Philip comes in with this, Lord, show us the way and we will be satisfied. Another disciple getting it wrong another disciple struggling. Both Thomas and Philip and Simon Peter before them and others exhibit throughout this um, journey in the Gospel of John some anxiety about being left behind, some anxiety about where are you going, Jesus? What are we gonna do when we don't have you? How can we not have you? You need to stay with us or we need to go with you. The disciples are compelled and challenged by geography. Geography. Where are you going? We want to go to. Let's pack our bags and off we're going to go. Jesus understanding this, Jesus having sympathy, Jesus trying to give them this comfort is giving them an answer. And the answer both hits on the geography of the question, but also the spirit of the question. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. The word translated here in John's gospel as the way can connote both some geography, a road trip, thank you very much, and traveling, but it can also be a more metaphorical um, 
connotations such as, I am the way of life. I am the way of being. I am the way that you are going to live. So I'm the path that you'll walk, but also, I want you to live in this way. You can hear as we're talking about that, that, that Jesus really is hitting on things that are of ultimate concern. Where have I come from? What am I gonna do while I'm here? And where do I go after everything's done? How do I live now? How will I live later? I am the way, the truth, and the life answers these questions of ultimate importance. What are we supposed to do with our life? Jesus, believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, but if you do not, then believe me because of the works themselves. Jesus is offering a, of have faith, have faith in me, have faith God is with me, but if you don't, look at what I do. How many times do we, um, are we told in life, trust what you see other people doing, right? There's something about what you say, but there's another thing about what you do. That's where Jesus is driving. Very truly, I tell you, the one who believes in me will also do the works that I do, and in fact, will do greater works. Do you hear in that? I am the way, and I encourage you, I invite you, Jesus says, to live in this way. Jesus is challenging the disciples to have a heart for compassion and care that does good works. Have a heart and do the faith that I have showed you. That is the way he shows for living. He is also ending, coming close to the end of his days. He's returning to God. Where I go, there will be a place for you also. Where do we go after we aren't here? What do we do while we are here? Jesus is wrapping these answers to this question, or answers to those questions, this philosophical curiosity and, and struggle of heart that is our whole life. What am I supposed to do? What's the meaning of life? He begins with, do not let your heart be troubled. There's something so comforting and rich in this passage. Studying the life of Jesus always feels a little fleeting to me. His physical earthly life and ministry and healing and teaching um, lasted less than 40 years. Jesus didn't live to a ripe old age of 80 or 90 or 105 or any of that. But he gives us this message of how to live our lives how to have a way of life, how to be. And what he taught lasted well beyond those years that he had on this earth. And it grounds us, it calls us, and it comforts us. There's a poem from a, um, a contemporary author named Maggie Smith that I heard during Lent that I wanna share with you. It's called Good Bones. Um, it echoes Jesus' short life, and it echoes what are we supposed to do while we are here. Um, it echoes a relationship that parents have with their child, as God had with Jesus, as Jesus had with God, and as Jesus has with us, and God has with us. Um, and this poem, you know how parents want to protect their children from the harshness of the world? This poem frames that. And as I read it and as I've heard it read, it feels so godly and faithful to me of how God speaks to us with love through Jesus. It's okay. I'm going to be with you forever. No matter what we do or how it is, I'm with you. Um, listen to this poem. If you look confused, I'll read it twice, if, you know, because um, po poetry is like that. Sometimes it helps us to hear it multiple times. Good Bones by M Maggie Smith. Life is short, though I keep this from my children. Life is short, 
and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious, ill-advised ways. A thousand deliciously ill-advised ways. I'll keep from my children. The world is at least 50% terrible, and that's a conservative estimate, though I keep this from my children. For every bird, there is a stone thrown at a bird. For every loved child, a child broken, bagged, sunk in a lake. Life is short, and the world is at least half terrible. And for every kind stranger, there is one who would break you, though I keep this from my children. I am trying to sell them the world. Any decent realtor walking you through a real uh, bleep hole chirps on about good bones. This place could be beautiful, right? You could make this place beautiful. It is a beautiful poem that feels so faithful. Life is short. How do we speak to that? Life is challenging and hard and painful. How do we honor that and protect those we love from it? But life is also beautiful. How do we engage that and offer that with who we are? Let me do this one more time in conclusion. Good Bones by Maggie Smith. Life is short though I keep this from my children. Life is short, and I've shortened mine in a thousand delicious, ill-advised ways. A thousand deliciously ill-advised ways I'll keep from my children. The world is at least 50% terrible, and that is a conservative estimate, though I keep this from my children. For every bird, there is a, there is a stone thrown at a bird. For every loved child, a child broken, bagged, sunk in a lake. Life is short, and the world is at least half terrible. And for every kind stranger, there is one who would break you, though I keep this from my children. I am trying to sell them the world. Any decent realtor walking you through a real bleep hole chirps on about good bones. This place could be beautiful, right? You can make this place beautiful. At the end of our scripture today, Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask, if in my name you ask me for anything, I will do it. It is a family relationship we have with one another, with God through Jesus, this is a message of things that are of the most importance in our life and how we live our way. Live this way, Jesus teaches, so that ultimately we will live the way. Amen. Sanctuary for 
continue on in our Easter season, let us affirm our faith together. Will you join me in our affirmation of faith? We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is creating, who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh to reconcile and make new who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect in creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus, crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, In death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. do not need to be a member here or anywhere to be welcome at the table. This is a table of grace set by Jesus Christ from long ago. 
all are welcome. We believe that this, if you have a, a sincerity of heart to know Jesus better, you are welcome at the table. Um, we share communion in this place through intention right now. Uh, and as you come forward, you will receive a piece of bread in your hand with the words, uh, God is with you, body of Christ, love of Christ, any of these things. You take the bread, move over to the cup, dip it, and receive. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable with that, we have a gluten-free option and a, a, a less used uh, element station over here. So, um, and I'll put some sanitizer over there if you'd like that as well. Um, that's good. Let us begin now our uh, prayer of great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You formed us in your image and breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey, and set before us the way of life. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of your Son from the dead, and to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. Once we were no people, but now, O oh God, we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always, in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do it in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us, as together we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world, the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one in Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in final victory, and together we feast at God's heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, and with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Friends, this is the body of Christ, which is broken for you.
and this is the cup of redemption which is poured out for you. Frank, the body of Christ broken for you and the love of Christ poured out for you. Mm-hmm. Let me invite those who are helping to serve communion to come down front and we will uh, bring you the elements and bring you uh, a little uh, sanitizer. Let us pray. Holy God, you have poured your grace within us. We give you thanks for this blessing of the table, your life, and the call to life, the way. Amen. We come now in the service to the time of responding to God's compassion and grace through making an offering. Your offering in response to God's love can be a commitment to do good or to pray for others or to speak kind and encouraging words. Your offering in response to God's word can also be a financial contribution to the ministries of our church. It is through your financial gifts that we are able to provide this worship online and continue doing outreach and ministry. No financial gift is too small. Every dollar that you offer matters as we work to serve God every day and lift up people. Please continue using the QR code to make a contribution or mail in your check or consider making a regular monthly offering. Thank you so much for your support and thank you for this shared ministry that we do together. I invite you now to stand and share with me the invitation and dedication prayer. Together, let us pray. Redeeming God, the gifts we bring to you this day, we dedicate to the work of kingdom building. Even more, we offer ourselves as material for this work. Imperfect as we are, we know with Christ as the cornerstone, you can build your vision of mercy, justice, and peace and compassion here in our midst, in Christ our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Let us share together in the singing of Christ for the world we sing.
reminded that it can feel overwhelming to be a part of a church. There is so much need in the world and we just offered you about 10 different things that you can participate in. I remind you what Christ said, do not let your heart be troubled, but believe in me. Believe in me, he said. We can't as individuals do everything, but individuals and as a church, we can do a lot. Let your heart show you what it is that you're called to do. One little thing, a prayer, a smile, a gift, a giving. Let that be your hallmark of faith. Go now into the world, Christ's redeemed family, beloved always. Amen.